In early December 1938, I arrived at my first combat air station, Dibden, a few kilometres from the provincial town of Seffron Walden, Essex. With full confidence, I reported to the chief of air station staff that I was an experienced pilot with 129 hours of flying time. He directed me to the 29 Squadron headquarters, which was in one of three large hangars on the airfield. I immediately noticed that there were no gladiators there. All I saw were Hawker Demons, a two-seat, single-engine biplane fighters equipped with the first hydraulically powered armoured turret, turrets that housed the rear gunner. I experienced a shock. Outside the other hangars I spotted hurricanes from the 85th and 87th fighter squadrons. I took the stairs up to the office of my new squadron, disappointed and deceived in my expectations by the acting pilot officer. I was met by Flight Officer Britt, the squadron adjutant, and while I waited to see the commanding officer, he told me that the squadron was in the process of rearming to long-range fighters, which were a modification of the Blenheim Medium Bomber, a twin-engine monoplane. That was the end of it. Things were getting worse and worse. It was bad enough to see an obsolete demon, similar in many ways to the Hart and Odex, but the fact that I would now be flying a twin-engine, bomber-like airplane seemed to be an even greater injustice. Finally, I was introduced to Squadron Commander Squadron Leader Gomez, a graceful man who, as I noted, had only one leg. He welcomed me to the squadron and began to tell me something about its history and traditions, but unfortunately I was not a very attentive listener. I wanted, one way or another, to be in the single-seat fighter squadron. When he finished, I shook him to the core by informing him that I wanted to fly single-seat fighters and that he should make arrangements for me to be transferred to one of the other squadrons at the air station. I did not do this very tactfully and received a rather cold reply. Braham, we are proud of this squadron and I expect you, as a new pilot, to be proud to serve in it too. With that I was let go. With an unhappy look I walked out to the adjutant's office where Brett told me that I was assigned to B Squadron, commanded by Flight Officer Bill Cambridge. Arriving at his office, I walked in and introduced myself. As we exchanged handshakes, he said, Hey, I expect you to salute daily upon entering here for the first time and address me as a sir. There will be no other formalities. I believe the squadron commander had informed him that I was not enthusiastic about the squadron's aircraft, and I could tell from his manner that I should have watched myself. Contrary to its obsolete aircraft, the 29th was a very proud unit. There was an excellent competitive spirit between all three squadrons at Deb Dippy, and the 29th always managed to maintain its dignity in the various games played in the mess hall. I soon found this spirit permeating and began to forget my initial. Most of the officers in Deb Dep were my age. Only the Lincoln Squadron commanders were a few years older. Also in all three squadrons, the pilots were dominated by sergeants and they were fine people. After serving for about three months, I had my final checkup in one of the new Blapheims with which 29 Squadron had been rearmed. Prior to that, I had to content myself with flying a demon or as a passenger on a Blenheim with one of the experienced pilots of the squadron. During the visits of the Bomber Command boys, we heard a lot of bad things about the Blenheim from them. They said in particular that if you couldn't release the landing gear and land it on your belly, the airplane would explode. However, I did not encounter any difficulties during my final check ride. After that, I started to get my appropriate share of flying and became a full member of 23 Squadron. One day a gladiator arrived from Hawk Church with Pilot Officer Mackenzie on board. Mac was a New Zealander who had been at Shawbury with me. I started to persuade him to let me fly in his airplane, something I'd always dreamed of doing. After much persuasion, he agreed. Buckling me into the cockpit, Mac showed me the various buttons and switches. He concluded by saying, Hmm, for God's sake, don't break it, and waved me goodbye. I taxied out, turned against the wind, gave the throttle, and raced down the grass runway. A moment later I was airborne and gaining altitude quickly. I cautiously performed some elements of my rather run-of-the-mill aerobatics, and the longing to fly a single-seat fighter again gripped me. After a while I turned toward the airfield and landed. Mike was waiting for me, straight as a nail, because he realized that if I damaged the plane, he would have to answer for letting me use it without the consent of his squadron commander. I thanked him, feeling an overwhelming jealousy of his good fortune. This flight kept me busy for some time, and I could hardly resist going to my squadron commander again to ask for a transfer. By this time, however, the fact of being a member of 29 Squadron meant something to me, 
and my thoughts of remaining loyal to it prevailed. It was in these days that I acquired the nickname Bob, which has since stuck with me in the service. This more than once became a cause of confusion, for my parents and later my wife quite naturally called me John, the name given me at my baptism. It was customary at that time in squadrons calling pilots by radio to call them by their Christian names. There were several Johns in 29 Squadron, and to eliminate misunderstandings, it was decided that we Johns should draw a new name out of a hat. I drew Bob. That's how I became Bob and how I stayed Bob. The news and radio reports this time made it very clear that war with Germany was only a matter of time and that time was rapidly running out. Most of us were in favour of contrasting our skills with those of our German counterparts as soon as possible. I think many were still thinking in terms of chivalrous air duels like those fought by our fathers during the First World War. The new commander of 87 Squadron sobered us up rather quickly. Before being assigned to Devon, he had served as an air attack in Berlin, where he had ample opportunity to see the rapid build-up of Luftwaffe power. One day this officer gave a lecture to the entire Air Station Officer Corps and explained in detail that the new German Air Force was a real force to be reckoned with. Their new Messerschmitt fighters seemed to be on a par, with our Hurricanes, if not a little better, and were much better than the Blenheims of our squadron. We could have counted them with Spitfires, but these aircraft had only just been adopted. We still had extremely few of them. However, we were massively unconcerned and did not allow sober reasoning to bring us back to Earth. Early in August, the British and French air forces conducted an exercise to test air defences. During the entire period of the exercise we were under martial law, the closest thing to reality we could experience in peacetime. The exercise lasted a week, and we would take off on alert, always in the afternoon, trying to intercept the aggressor from Bomber Command or the French Bomber Air Force. Sometimes we were successful, but for the most part we were not. There was no radar control from the ground to put us on target, and we relied entirely on information from ground observation posts. Delays in transmitting information resulted in failed intercepts. We also found that the methods of attack prescribed by the tactics manual were of little value, and most of the time we were sitting ducks for the Wellingtons, Hamptons and Wheatley's tail gunners. These exercises did much to strengthen our air defence on the eve of war, which was now almost inevitable. One day in August we received the news with great excitement that we were to be rearmed with the latest hurricanes with variable pitch propellers. We were to be the first squadron to have this model of hurricane, so bells were ringing in our souls. We were receiving the new airplanes at the small airfield of the Hawker Company in Brooklyn. An extremely excited Bream flew in from there in a Blenheim. I had flown a hurricane with a constant pitch propeller once before, so after a brief briefing by Hawker personnel, I learned the principles of propeller pitch control and flew the airplane back to death. Toward the end of August, due to the deteriorating situation in Europe, vacations were cancelled. There were now two officers on duty around the clock at the same time. Their duties were to receive and decipher incoming signals. On the night of September 2, Pilot Officer Vinnie and I were on duty. We had received information that Great Britain intended to declare war on Germany. All squadrons were put on the highest degree of alert. In a week or less, the 85th and 87th squadrons left for France. At Debnam they were replaced by the 17th Squadron, also equipped with hurricanes, the old ones with constant pitch propellers. It was widely believed that England would be immediately attacked by hordes of German bombers, and many of us gazed into the distance, waiting for them to appear. Before it was time for breakfast on the first day of the war, a whole squadron took to the air on alert to intercept a bogey approaching the east coast. It was us. Lack of experience flying our new airplanes we, of course, made up for in fortitude. As soon as we were up in the air, a guidance officer came on the radio, who ordered us at the highest possible speed at a course of 90 degrees to rise to 4,600 metres. Here we go. I turned on the electric mirror sight to be ready for the moment when the Luftwaffe planes would appear in the field of view. But soon we got the call-off signal and turned home disappointed. The alarm turned out to be a false alarm. A few days later, from the headquarters of the 11th Air Group came the OR. 29th Squadron every day to keep one unit at the forward base at Wattisham, Suffolk. This was the airfield where the Blenheims of the 2nd Air Group of Bomber Command were based. Every day during September, one of our squadrons flew at dawn to this forward base, while the remaining squadron was on standby at Debon. On landing at Wattisham, we would spread our six or nine hurricanes around the control room, 
and, sitting on the grass if it was dry, or in a wooden barrack if it was damp, we would wait for a possible alarm. At first we looked upon our hosts, the bomber pilots, as rather prudent gentlemen, but they began to get involved in the fighting much earlier than we did, very boldly attacking German ships in the East Frisian Islands area and military targets on the North German coast. During this period we received many false alarms. These gave us experience flying our new machines and we soon felt we could compete with anyone. One day in late September 1939, Squadron leader Gomez received word that 29 Squadron, among four other squadrons, was to be immediately converted to a night fighter squadron. Naturally, we were not enthusiastic when we learned that we were to transfer our beloved Hurricanes to another squadron and in return receive our old short-nosed Blenheims. The Blenheim was equipped with one forward-firing machine gun in the right wing and one Vickers machine gun in the rear turret. The savvy guys at HQ realised that in order to use this plane in a fighter role, more armament would be needed. So we were delivered under fuselage containers with four more forward-firing 7.7 machine guns, and our concern was to adapt these containers to the aircraft. Ground staff and crews laboured day and night until this job, a very difficult job, mind you, was done. We spent the next few months preparing for our new role, and since none of us had the slightest idea as to how to do night combat, our training was quite varied. We did not have any onboard radar and ground-based guidance existed, then only in its most rudimentary. Our night patrols consisted mainly of flying over groups of signal rockets placed on the ground in various ways. Signal rockets were laid out in a special way on the ground every few kilometres at a distance of 20-30 km, forming a patrol line. From these lines we were directed to a particular point in space in an attempt to intercept one of our own aircraft simulating the enemy. Success was a matter of chance and depended on the presence or absence of cloud cover so that the fighter crew could see the flares from an altitude of 3,000 metres or more. At other times we worked in conjunction with searchlights. There were enough moments when an airplane could be seen in the cone of their beams. But by the time the fighter turned in the direction of the target, the searchlights had lost the enemy and were wandering aimlessly across the sky. When the fighter shortened the distance, it was invariably illuminated in such a way that the pilot was temporarily blind, or at least lost the ability for night vision, making any further attempts to spot the elusive enemy fruitless. Still, this training, which at times seemed futile, helped us in the future. The night fighters were beginning to find their methods of operation. Although our combat losses at this stage were zero, we lost some fine crews in the weather fight. Everyone realised that the enemy could take off in good weather, bomb targets in the UK blind, return and land again in good weather. Night fighters had to take off in the nastiest weather to intercept invading enemy aircraft and then return in the same weather. The losses we were sustaining were not acceptable in peacetime, but there was an urgent need to move forward if we were to defeat the enemy in the night sky. As I and my air gunner, leading aircraft Matimayim Harris, were returning from our new forward base at Martlitsam Head, near Ipswich, I was involved in my first flying accident. There had been quite a heavy snowfall the night before, and the grass surface of Martlitsham was covered with a layer of snow 10 to 12 centimetres thick. I didn't take this too seriously, and Harris and I taxied out on our Blenheim and turned upwind. The takeoff in this direction was short, and the pilot had to be mindful of the trees growing just beyond the run up distance. Having checked the engines, I gave full throttle, and the old Blenheim began to pick up speed. It soon became clear that although the engines were giving all they could, the airplane was not growing fast enough, but I missed the moment when I could have slowed down. I was too far down the runway to take off the throttle and stop on the slippery ground without crashing into the trees now growing menacingly ahead. Remembering to warn Harris to hold on, I pulled the wheel toward me, trying to lift the Blenheim into the air. As soon as it was off the ground, I quickly, as fast as I could, began retracting the landing gear to reduce braking. But the airplane had barely reached breakaway speed and therefore crashed to the ground with enough force to break one of the hydraulic cylinders of the main landing gear strut. We heard a metallic crack and both realised what had happened, but our primary concern was to get past the trees. We barely made it. I contacted ground control at Martlitsham and relayed that I had damaged the landing gear but was returning to the main base at Debden where the aircraft was easier to repair. During the 30-minute flight I had plenty of time to think, old stories of Blenheims turning into a fiery trap in the event of landing on their bellies surfaced in my mind. 
As I approached the base, I was ordered to fly in a circle and burn out as much fuel as possible. Gomez took off in his airplane to inspect the damage to my Blenheim. He confirmed that one landing gear strut was hanging with a broken hydraulic cylinder. This suggested one of three options. Landing on our belly, the landing gear retracted so that the dangling strut would break as soon as we touched the ground. Landing on one wheel, or we would jump out with parachutes. Gomez told me, decide for yourself. When I asked Harris if he wanted to jump out by parachute or stay with me, as I tried to land on my belly, I'm used to you and the airplane. I appreciated his confidence and informed the command post of my decision. And as I continued to circle over the airfield at about 450 meters altitude, I could see a crowd of crews and ground personnel standing on the concrete pad in front of the hangar and resembling spectators at a car race waiting for disaster. There were also the ominous fire truck and ambulance. I swallowed hard and turned downwind, then across the wind, and then began the final leg of the approach, reducing speed as much as possible. The snow-covered ground was fast approaching. At the last moment I pulled the helm sharply toward my belly. The first touch was light, but it was immediately followed by a much stronger impact, accompanied by crunching and grinding. At 145 km, the good old Blenheim slid on its belly in a cloud of snow for about a hundred meters. After checking that all the necessary toggle switches were off, Harris and I quickly climbed out through the overhead hatch, right into the arms of the air station commander and a crowd of our comrades. The air station commander, a Canadian, congratulated me on a good show. I later received a reprimand from him for not checking conditions before takeoff at Martlicham. The reprimand was well deserved, and I learned another valuable lesson for myself. The Blenheim was not too badly damaged. This incident had one good consequence for the squadron. We all now knew that on a Blenheim it was possible to land on your belly and not fly upwards in a cloud of smoke. Gomez was soon transferred to a staff job and was replaced by a squadron leader, New Zealander McLean. Mac continued to keep the morale and spirit of the 29th at a high level. It was a difficult time for all Blenheim night fighter squadron commanders, as our comrades in their hurricanes and spits fought hard against the enemy in the daytime skies over France, covering the retreat of Allied armies and engaging in sporadic engagements over the East Coast and convoys. As soon as Mac arrived, a delegation of officers appeared at the door of his office demanding transfer to day fighter squadrons. His response was, If I can stand it, so can you. It will be our turn too, so let's make an effort to make sure that by that time the squadron is really in the best shape possible. Throughout the first few months of 1940, we continued to develop our night fighting tactics, although we still had no airborne radar. By continuous training, we improved our cat's eye techniques, operating over patrol lines from signal lights and in conjunction with anti-aircraft searchlights. Our sunset and dawn patrol flights from Martlicham were also intensified because of enemy cowardly and wanton bombing and machine gun fire on some of our defenseless coastal floating beacons. I was leading one of these dawn patrols of two Blenheims, with our relatively new pilot named Sisman in the other plane. We had already been patrolling for some time when he shouted over the radio telephone. Hmm. Plane on the left, about eight kilometers away. Moving the throttle sector levers forward, we made a wide turn, gliding over the crests of the wheel, and I also saw in the distance a Junkers 88 flying parallel to our coastal convoy. A race was on between Sisman and myself to see who could get to the enemy first. The poor old Blenheims creaked with every rivet as we gave full throttle. My flight gunner Harris deployed his turret and fired a few short test bursts from his Vickers machine gun, and as I also checked my armament I could see smoke plumes behind Sisman's under fuselage machine gun container as he did the same. We still had another four or five kilometers to go, and the distance was gradually decreasing when the Junkers 88 must have seen us. He turned away, heading back towards the coast of Belgium or Holland. Its exhaust spouts were throwing out black smoke, as if it were running on coal, and it was obvious that it would soon get away from us. Sisman and I poured out many curses when our attempt to intercept the enemy proved unsuccessful. We wished we had been on hurricanes, for then of course we would have caught him. In early April 1940, the squadron was ordered to move urgently to Dram, near Edinburgh, to cover troop convoys going to Norway. The morale of the 29th rose again. We felt confident that we would face German air opposition. We were told that we were to patrol from dusk to dawn in the skies over the ships, 
going to Firth of Forth back to Forth. We shared Dram Airfield with a couple of fighter squadrons from Auxiliary Aviation equipped with Spitfires. They had been in business since the Heinkel 111 raid in October 1939 and had fought hard against the enemy. So we felt a kind of inferiority complex again. Among these fine fellows were great pilots like Russ Berry, who became an ace and wing commander during the North African campaign. In May the squadron returned to Deb Dep, where it continued night training, and the forward unit was again stationed at Martlitsham. Meanwhile, the war seemed hopeless for the Allies. We were encountering serious setbacks everywhere, and it seemed that the 29th was doomed to be left out of the fighting. McLean was probably more frustrated than anyone, as he pestered Air Group headquarters with constant requests to send us somewhere from which we could reach the enemy. Mac represented a great example to all of us, and despite many frustrations, thanks to his encouragement, we continued our night training. We continued to develop tactics in preparation for the day when we would finally have to face the enemy. Many of our contrivances now seem foolish. We experimented with night group flights, believing that the greater number of fighters we could direct against a single enemy airplane would give us a better chance of shooting it down. This tactic may have been good in the daytime, but it was rendered meaningless because we had no airborne radar. It took real precision to fly at night in a group with the navigation lights out and only the crew of the lead plane could visually spot the enemy. The pilot of the wingman had to keep his leader in sight at all times, and we soon abandoned this tactic and reverted to single interception sorties. Training our night vision, we flew in pairs, one playing the role of the target, the other, the fighter. The target ahead would slowly gain altitude with lights on while the fighter tried to visually detect it. Then the fighter would increase the throttle and gradually approach, simulating an attack. We called this sneaking and thus learned to find another airplane in the night sky. For some time we heard about the work of our scientists in developing an airborne radar, known as A-1, which allowed the fighter crew to spot a target at a range of several kilometers by signals that the radar operator saw on the screen of an electron beam tube. Part of the work with the first samples was carried out on the Blenheims at Martlitsham Head. During our regular visits there, we noticed an aircraft belonging to a fighter interceptor unit fitted with special antennas on the leading edges of the wings and in the nose of the fuselage. One day, our squadron at Debbipi also received several such airplanes for testing. Instruction regarding their equipment was short, while there were few among us who knew anything about it. The turret installations were removed on these airplanes, and our flight gunners now had to be retrained or learn on their own how to operate these magical devices located in the innards of the old Blenheim. The first models of radar proved to be very unreliable and had little chance of success. Usually after taking off on a night patrol, the pilot would report that the radar was unusable. A sigh of relief would be heard and the flight gunner would scramble forward to add another pair of eyes by sitting down beside the pilot to more successfully detect the enemy. In June 1940, the squadron scored its first victory. It was both a happy and sad event. The pilot of the Blenheim, Pilot Officer Barnwell, was the son of one of the designers of the airplane, who had been killed in a plane crash a few years earlier. On that occasion, Barnwell was operating from Martletsam and took off on the alert to meet enemy aircraft approaching Ipswich. A few minutes later, we heard machine gun bursts in the air and saw a burning airplane which went down near the airfield. So Barnwell recorded on the squadron's account the first downed enemy airplane, Heinkel 111. Soon we heard the sounds of another battle in the sky and spotted another burning airplane. John did not return, and we learned that he had been shot down in combat with the second enemy and had fallen into the sea near the shore. Both the pilot and his flight gunner were killed. The squadron had lost one of its most popular members at that time. Harry Will flew an airplane that was not equipped with radar. He was helped to find the enemy solely by searchlights and anti-aircraft artillery, and although he paid an extraordinary price, he proved to all of us that our seemingly aimless nighttime cat's eye training had not been in vain. At the end of June, the squadron from Dedden was sent to Digby, in Lincolnshire. This was a heavy blow. It seemed that HQ intended to keep our squadron as far away from the enemy as possible. Most of the day fighter squadrons had been completely exsanguinated in the fighting over France and during the evacuation of our troops from Dunkirk. One or two of the night fighter squadrons regularly scored victories over the south coast and near London, but not us. However, at the new base we soon settled down, our spirits kept up by Mac and his newly arrived adjutant. 
our father confessor Sammy Fred. He had been a World War I pilot, and like many men of his generation, had given up civilian work to go to war a second time. Digby had much the same routine as Debon, mainly night action in conjunction with searchlights. This part of the country did not yet have radar guidance stations for fighter interceptors. Our only real leaders were searchlights and anti-aircraft artillery. Wherever anti-aircraft shell bursts were visible or searchlight beams converged, there could probably be an airplane, and we headed there to find it. We often saw fleeting shadows of airplanes, only to lose them again. One night I was on duty as part of a B unit led by Sandy Campbell. Out of nothing to do, we had a race around the barracks near the aircraft parking lot. Peter Sisman and I thought it was time to level Sandy, as a joke of course, but Sandy was an extremely large man, and we were in for a rough ride. In the midst of the friendly scuffle, the phone rang. Breathless, we froze in place. Grabbing the phone, Sandy listened for a moment and shouted to Sisman and me to take off immediately, and he would follow shortly. The three of us, along with the flight gunners, rushed in the darkness to our planes and roared into the sky, still out of breath from our mock fight. I set a course for one of the flare patrol lines near the coast and announced that I would be barraging at 2400 meters altitude at all times. Sandy and Sisman were directed to other patrol lines. My flight gunner drew my attention to anti-aircraft fire in the distance and a few seconds later, I heard Sisman's voice over the radio reporting that he had fired on a Heinkel. I put my Blenheim into a steep turn and turned in his direction. We heard Peter's voice again, but this time it sounded very excited and it was difficult to make out the words. He was probably ordering his gunner to turn off the lights. Then there was silence, and we saw a huge flash on the ground ahead. What was it? A bomb explosion or the Heinkel that Seisman was shooting at? The ground control center couldn't tell us anything and after an hour ordered us back to base. In the barracks parking lot I was greeted by Sandy who, although happy to see us again, looked worried as he was sure there had been a mishap with one of our planes. Since I had returned and Sisman was gone, we concluded that he must have been the one with whom something must have happened. Sandy had heard the same unintelligible conversation on the radio that I had heard, and had indeed seen an airplane with its identification lights on fired upon by another airplane. It caught fire and crashed. It looked as if poor old Sismay had left the identification lights on after all, when he attacked a jerry whose tail gunners were using them as an aiming point. The next day our fears were confirmed. Finding the crash site, Sisman and his tail gunner were dead. They were buried with military honours. I was one of those who carried the coffin, and although everyone in wartime becomes callous to death, the funeral of a good friend who we had teased because of his schoolboy appearance made a deep impression on me. His parents and sister attended the funeral and we, his comrades, tried to give them some encouragement. They held up beautifully and I think they took their tragedy more stoically than many of his fellow pilots. Early in my stay at Digby, a friend of mine from the Women's Auxiliary gave me a beautiful little English setter puppy. It was a very touching animal and I decided to try to train it to Blenheim. At first I thought the noise would frighten him, but I soon found him curled up on the floor of the cabin near me as if nothing had happened. He did not stay with me long. Charles Vinney came up to me in the dining room and told me that my dog had died crossing the road. He had been hit by an army truck. I retired to my apartment and cried. I had grown very fond of that adorable little dog and vowed that I would never get another, a promise I kept for a long time. Shortly after the start of the Battle of Britain in late July 1940, our much-loved squadron leader McLean was transferred to a staff post and his place was taken by squadron leader Charles Widows. The whole squadron became attached to Kiwi Mac. We gave him a raucous farewell party and promised that the 29th would follow him in full if he ever got another squadron under his command. Like all good commanders, he sobered us up a bit toward the end of the event by asking that we give the new squadron commander the same support we had given him. At first glance Widows seemed a bit of a bore, but we soon got used to him and during his long period of command, he proved to be not only quite a fastidious, but also a very brave man. Shortly after Widows arrived, Dave Humphrey over the East Coast attacked, and probably shot down a Heinkel 111. The rest of us regarded this with some jealousy and wondered why the elusive enemy was not appearing in our path. Some night fighter crews on the South Coast, and in the London area, had already achieved a very substantial number of victories, and the names of John Cunningham and his radar operator Rawnsley were soon on everyone's lips. 
There were now so many airborne radio operators in the squadron that we had a continuous change of crew members. However, like all other pilots, I preferred to fly with a select few. Pilot officers Wilson and Watson, Sergeants Wilsden, Waller, Wingfield and Moss were among those with whom I operated successfully. It was abundantly clear that success was most likely to be achieved by a crew that flew together regularly and whose members fully understood each other. August 24, 1940, became one of the most successful days for the guys in the daytime fighter aviation and for me personally. That night Sergeant Wilsden and I achieved our first victory. From the first night hours there was a great deal of activity over the Humber area and it wasn't long before B formation received orders to fly out to our patrol lines. The night was dark, not a cloud in the sky. I was patrolling back and forth over my area at an altitude of 3,000 meters, watching far to the north for anti-aircraft artillery and searchlights. Suddenly I felt someone tapping me on the shoulder, and from surprise I almost jumped out of the airplane. Closed in himself had scrambled out of his turret and crawled through the insides of the airplane to shout in my air. Would you like a bottle of beer and a sandwich? It was so unexpected that I bent over laughing. Accepting the offer, I gave him a friendly tap and ordered him back to his turret. I enjoyed my beer despite the fact that such beverages were strictly forbidden on airplanes. I continued to request over the radio to the duty officer of the Air Defense Sector Operations Center if there was any work for me. Finally, he answered positively and directed me to the searchlights, the beams of which were several kilometers ahead. Adding gas, we headed there, and suddenly in the distant beam I could distinguish an airplane, which seemed like a moth flying in the bright light. The excitement in our Blenheim now peaked. I moved the ring sight to the firing position and gave a short, warm-up burst from my machine guns. Since Wilsden in the tail, the turret did not have a good view forward. I quickly informed him of what I saw in the searchlights and heard him fire a test burst from his single Vickers machine gun. It seemed like an eternity as we shortened the distance. But it really only took a few minutes. Not only was I excited, but I had opened fire from too great a distance and, inexcusably, without even identifying the aircraft. My tracers showed that I was too far away, so I continued to approach but more calmly. I now identified the aircraft, a twin-engine Doria bomber. Other searchlights were darting in the sky around us, and as I shortened my distance I noticed a brief glimpse of a hurricane flying across the searchlight beam. It was above me and suddenly I heard Wilsden's machine gun rumbling behind me. I realized that he was firing at the hurricane by mistake, as the Dornier was still ahead of us. I shouted over the intercom for him to cease firing, but it was too late as I could see in the searchlights that there was a plume of what looked like glycol leaking from the engine behind the hurricane. I didn't say anything to Wilsden at the time, as I knew it would torment him. Besides, I was not sure if it was the consequence of his fire, for perhaps the hurricane had been hit by the fire of our anti-aircraft artillery, which was firing thick and fast. By this time I was within range of the Dornier, whose searchlights were still industriously illuminating for us. But unfortunately the speed of approach was so great that I had time only for a very short burst of fire while I tried unsuccessfully to reduce my speed. However, I was pleased to see the smoke and sparks that appeared when my bullets hit him. As I could not keep up behind him, I gradually approached him from his starboard side, as close as I could get, so that Wilsden could deploy his machine gun. This enabled him to fire a line at the enemy's most vulnerable spot, the cockpit. The German gunners must have been blinded or wounded, for there was no return fire as we slowly flew by. Wilsden was firing long bursts from his machine gun. I saw the flames and at the same instant heard Wilsden shout joyfully. Mmm, I've made it. The Dornier slowly banked on its left wing and went into a dive that became steeper and steeper as it approached the ground with a plume of fire behind it. We flew in a circle waiting for it to fall and then gleefully turned back to base, shouting our success over the radio to the sector command post and anyone who could hear. On the way back my excitement subsided as I had time to reflect on the hurricane. I hoped and prayed that its pilot was unhurt, dreading the thought that he might have been hit by our fire. Finally, we made a circle over the dimly lighted strip and landed. Everyone on the airfield had heard of our good fortune, for the sector headquarters had already called. We got out of the airplane and were showered with congratulations from the ground staff. When the pat on the backs were over, the intelligence officer took our victory report and a detailed combat report from us. I told him about the hurricane incident and Charles Widows, who was also listening to our report, 
sent a request to sector headquarters to find out which squadron's hurricanes had flown that night and whether all had returned safely. He was told that the pilot of one hurricane reported that he was hit by his own anti-aircraft artillery and jumped out by parachute, but was not injured. The main thing is that he survived. Wills Dane and I now rightly considered our victory unconditional. But we learned that the anti-aircraft gunners in the Humber area also reported a Dornier shot down, and since only one plane had fallen to the ground, there was a dispute between the Army and the Air Force as to who to give the victory to. According to our intelligence officer's opinion, morally the Army needed the victory to inspire the gunners to do even better. I was slightly offended by this attitude, as I thought that if anyone needed such an inoculation, it was the 29th Squadron, which had so far taken little part in the fighting. Eventually the matter was settled amicably and the victory was given to us. After the first fight, I realized that I wanted to be in combat again. The excitement of the hunter had gripped me. One day, shortly after our first victory, I was standing outside the airplane maintenance hangar at Digby talking to several pilots and gunners in the squadron. The day was overcast with layered clouds at about 300 meters, but with excellent visibility below. We watched as several Canadian hurricanes, which had earlier risen on alert, came in for a landing after taking off. All but two had landed when a Junkers 88 appeared out of the clouds just above the airfield and began to go out to attack. We shouted until we were hoarse, uselessly trying to attract the attention of the two hurricanes still in the air. They seemed oblivious to the enemy's presence. Suddenly it dawned on us that this brute was going to bomb or shell just where we were standing. Junkers, diving hollowly in the direction of the hangars, let out from its nose machine gun's long lines, intended for each of us personally. We rushed to a nearby shelter. In my haste, I ran into Charles' widows. We fell down, apologizing repeatedly, while a series of explosions sounded on the airfield. After that, firing a few more bursts, the enemy disappeared into the clouds. The two red-faced hurricane pilots, who never saw the elusive enemy, landed shortly afterward. It is fair to say that the German left them no chance, as he retreated under the protection of the clouds as soon as he executed the attack. He had probably spotted the hurricanes and wanted to get the hell out of here as soon as possible. After the arrival of another squadron of hurricanes at Digby, it was decided that 29 squadron should relocate to Wellipbor. At first we were not happy about leaving the comfort of the canteen and our Canadian friends, but we soon found that our accommodation at Wellingore was excellent. In addition, the fact that the squadron had its own airfield played a major part in keeping our morale in excellent condition, during the late summer and fall of 1940. In September, we began to receive aircraft of a variety of types to consolidate and refine our night fighting tactics. At this stage, we had, in addition to our Blenheims, several hurricanes and one or two Syrieri battles, which had been used earlier in the year in France as light bombers. They suffered very heavy losses in their daring attacks as they could not compete with the German fighters. We immediately began using the Hurricanes not only for night sorties but also during the day to defend the airfield from attacks like the one we had experienced at Digby. It was excellent to fly these fine machines again, even though they were less suited to night fighting than the Blenheims. Although we had no success with our few Hurricanes, either by day or night, Flight Lieutenant Stevens, a pilot from 151 Squadron based at Wittering, achieved fantastic results at night in this aircraft without any assistance other than searchlights and anti-aircraft artillery fire, into which he flew recklessly in search of the enemy. His tactics were based on the belief that the Germans must be somewhere near the bursts of anti-aircraft shells. Often he was right, and this tactic, together with his remarkable eyesight, enabled him to reap a large harvest. Later, after destroying 14 enemy planes at night on his hurricane, he died over Europe. He was truly a remarkable pilot. I've already briefly mentioned the equipment with which some of our Blenheims were equipped. Owing to our lack of skill in its use and its early stage of development, we seldom remembered it, but soon our attitude toward radar changed radically. Already one or two night fighter squadrons stationed in the south had been rearmed with powerful buffighters, twin-engine, two-seat night fighters carrying four 20M guns and six 7.7M machine guns. All of this armament was mounted for forward firing and was pilot-controlled. This aircraft remained the most heavily armed fighter during the war and was the first British aircraft with a satisfactorily working radar. 
The equipment and operator were housed in the tail section of the fuselage and were covered by a transparent plexiglass dome using two small electron beam tubes. The radar operator could lead the pilot to any enemy aircraft that appeared within its range. The radar's range was equivalent to the fighter's flying altitude. For example, if a bow fighter was flying at 3,700 meters, it could theoretically detect a target aircraft up to 3,700 meters. In fact, reflections of the signal from the ground surface and interference on it reduced this range. The radar, designated AIMBK-4, was also capable of detecting targets behind, although its range in the rear hemisphere was limited by the effect of reflections from the fighter's surface. Radar-equipped boy fighters began arriving in squadrons at the same time that GCI radars were rapidly being erected along the coast of England. Guidance operators using these radars were now able to bring day or night fighters within 1.5 to 3 kilometers of the enemy. This was a major advance. A GCI officer could bring a radar-equipped night fighter to a target at a distance sufficient for its radio operator to make radar contact with it. It was then up to the crew of the boy fighter to complete the intercept and destroy the enemy. John Cunningham and his radio operator, Rawnsley, on his radar-equipped fighter, had already achieved great success in night fighting and became one of the best night fighter crews of the war. We had heard that the 29th was eventually to receive the boo fighters as well, and early in September one of these fine machines came to us for a demonstration. Some of us were allowed to fly it, although I was still a pilot officer. I was now one of the veterans of the squadron, and so I was among the lucky few who got to fly the Boo fighter. After the Blenheim it seemed huge, especially for a fighter, but it was well thought out. The view from the cockpit was excellent. The instruments and controls were much more conveniently placed than on the old Blenheim. After flying in circles for a few minutes, I landed and taxied back to the squadron commander's parking lot, who was watching my flight along with the ground staff. What did you think of him? Uh, Charles Widows asked. I can't wait to get him. It's amazing, I replied. The other pilots who flew it were unanimous that it was a great answer to enemy night bombers. But the commander said that we would have to be patient. It would be at least two months before we could be rearmed with bullfitters. Shortly afterwards I learned that I had been promoted to the higher rank of flying officer. There were now many new faces at Wellingore among them Flight Officers Miles and Davidson, who had come straight from flying schools, and Flight Lieutenant Guy Gibson, who had transferred to us after a bomber tour to try his hand as a night fighter. During his time with us, Guy became a first-class night fighter pilot and shot down three enemy aircraft. But his first love was Bomber Command, and he returned there and eventually led the famous Dyke Raid, for which he was awarded the Victoria Cross. He later died over Holland. Another member of the Bomber Air Force who joined us at the same time was Flag Officer Don Parker. He was awarded the Grand Cross for rescuing the crew from a crashed and burning bomber. He also returned to Bomber Command and died a brave death. In due course, it was my turn to lead a formation at Terry Hill, one of our small dedicated units away from the main base. I flew out there at the head of four Blenheims joined by PFC, to Wilson, the new flight officer, and the indomitable Flight Sergeant Sims, who was to be in charge of the ground staff. At Turnhill, the unit headquarters was in a tent where a telephone had been set up to receive takeoff orders to us from the flight control room. I had little to do besides visiting the air station commander and Jack Leather, the Spitfire commander of the 611th Squadron. The Spitfires were on standby duty from the first rays of dawn until dusk, and then they were replaced by us. One day at dawn we had just turned in and were about to go to bed when there was the rumble of a low-flying airplane. I ran to the window and under the lower edge of the clouds, which was at an altitude of about 180 metres. I saw a Junkers 88 turning around to pass over the airfield. I irritably rushed to my closet where I kept my 5.6 mass sporting rifle, grabbed and loaded it, and leaned out the window, hoping the Junkers would pass close enough for me to fire. What I wanted to accomplish with this squishy weapon I don't know, but it seemed better than watching defencelessly and waiting to strike. By this time, the Juicer's 88s had already begun their attack, and the spit parking lot was still clear of the sound of engines starting. The enemy made a beautiful approach on one of the large main hangars, which was full of training planes, Ansons and others, and one of my Blenheims, which was under repair. It was a first-class attack, and his bombs hit exactly into the hangar, raising columns of fire and smoke. He then flashed past our apartments firing machine guns at every possible target on the way. Finally, 
It went up into the low clouds and disappeared, accompanied by my 5.6M bullet fired from a range of about 300 metres. I pulled on my clothes and rushed to the hangar. Mechanics were trying to roll airplanes out of the burning building. When I met my fly sergeant, I saw that he had everything under control and that our airplane, which was unfit to fly, had been rolled outside without major damage. But most of the training airplanes were on fire. No one seemed to be seriously injured, although someone was carried out through the chancery window. Having done what I could, I went back to my apartment to go to bed when someone yanked me back. Where's your cap? It was the air station's chief of administration, a World War I veteran and a rather clingy individual. I apologised and said that I was in a hurry to check if my men and aircraft were all right and therefore had forgotten it. My reply did not impress him, and he continued to reprimand me. At this point I thought he was overdoing it and rudely remarked that, with his permission I would go to bed as I had been up all night. This enemy attack, and the previous attack on the airfield at Digby, conducted in very difficult weather conditions, gave us the impression of the Germans' superior navigation and supported the belief in the rumour that pilots who had lived in England before the war were leading such raids. On both occasions they dropped out of low clouds just above the airfields, attacked, and then got away unharmed. A night or two later Wilson and I took off on alert because of enemy activity in the Liverpool area. The night was dark with wisps of clouds between 3,000 and 4,600 metres. The guidance officer directed us to the bandit at 3,700 and in the distance we could see the bursts of anti-aircraft shells and the beams of several searchlights. I checked my machine guns and told Willie to fire a line from his. I felt sure that one way or another we would soon catch another German. But this time I was going to keep more calm and not fire until I got close to him. The air defence sector officer would inform us of course changes, indicating that we were getting closer to the enemy. Sometimes we would enter the clouds, which meant a quick transition from visual flight to instrument flight. Then after a few minutes we were back in clear skies. The anti-aircraft bursts and searchlights were closer now, so the enemy had to be somewhere nearby. There were no lights on the ground, though in the gaps between the clouds I could distinguish shadows that showed where the darker land merged with the lighter sea. Occasionally there were flashes of fire on the ground far below, probably anti-aircraft artillery firing, or perhaps they were Manchester or Liverpool bomb bursts. The guidance officer's voice became more strained. Your markings have merged. Be very careful. We were very close now. His words implied that the distance between us was from a few kilometres to a few metres. Suddenly I noticed a glow from what appeared to be two stars slightly above me. I saw that they were moving. They were not stars. They were the glow from the exhaust outlets of a twin-engine airplane. I shouted to Wilson. Hmm? Can you see the airplane above us? He replied. I can see the exhausts. I smoothly pointed the Blenheim upward and added gas to shorten the distance between us. I couldn't tell what kind of airplane it was, then I flew into a cloud. Damn it, we're going to lose it now. But a moment later we were back in clear skies and he was close enough to me to make out his silhouette. One keel and a tail stabilizer. Must have been a Heinkel or a Yupp Kurs 88, but I still wasn't sure. We passed through another cloud. The cloud cover was clearly increasing. I needed to do something quickly, or I would lose him. I called the control centre and reported that I was behind the aircraft but could not determine who it belonged to. The air defence sector guidance officer confirmed it was the enemy. We were the only friendly fighter in the area. I had to fire on it immediately before I lost it in the clouds. I knew I was outside the effective firing range of 800 metres, but hoped for a lucky hit. I took aim between the exhaust lights. A long line and I saw what appeared to be sparks shooting out from the enemy. Those had to be hits. Damn it, he headed for the cloud again. I followed him, but this time the cloud was bigger. I held course and altitude by instruments, desperately hoping that the enemy would be in the same position relative to me when we entered clear skies. However, we had no luck. He was nowhere to be seen. We flew aimlessly, hoping to find him again, but to no avail. Disappointed, we turned back to Terry Hill as we had little fuel left. After landing, Willie and I reported the attack to the intelligence officer, but claimed no victory as we felt we had caused little damage. The long-promised blue fighters began to arrive at our location. The Germans also effectively stopped their massive daytime raids and moved to a full-scale night offensive.
London was soon to feel Hitler's manic wrath at the indiscriminate night attacks by his planes. If German attacks were directed against Midland or ports on the East Coast, we would engage. Immediately after our return to Turnhill, we began an intensive program of day and night training on the Buff Fighters, while continuing at the same time to remain on standby with our few available Blenheims and Hurricanes. These were busy days, which all my friends and I managed to get through without any trouble. The squadron had at its disposal a small two-seat monoplane, the Master, which we used as a liaison aircraft. Sometimes on a weekend the squadron commander would let one of us take it. Between serious work we could always find time to circle the airfield in the Maggie and do some aerobatics. One morning Charles Wynne, flying a circle at low altitude, saw me. The next thing I remember was the Maggie performing a slide over my head. I ran to the parking lot of the Blenheim and asked one of the mechanics working in the airplane, who was laughing at the spectacle, to hand me a take signal gun from the cockpit. As Vinnie descended for another attack, I fired a red flare at him from my portable anti-aircraft gun. This game continued for ten or so minutes, and the squadron and ground staff settled around to watch the mock battle. Flakeman Bram would fall flat on his face when a Maggie flew very low over him, and would then fire his berry gun at close range. Eventually we tired of this game, and Whippen landed, rejoicing in his success, as evidenced by the state of my dirty uniform. Widows was absent that time, or I'm sure our little but dangerous game would have been put an immediate end to. See, a few days later, it was my turn. I was flying over the airfield with Jackie Pei G, one of our flying officers, occupying the rear cockpit, when I noticed a figure, which I assumed must be a friend of Wynne's, strolling across the field. This was too good a chance to pass up. It was time for revenge. He descended, and I saw with great satisfaction that he had fallen to the ground. I repeated my raid, and he was again forced to throw himself to the ground before he took cover in the parking lot of our planes. I was congratulating myself on my success when Jackie spoke into the inter. You know, I don't think it was Charles. Well, then who was it? I think it was the old man. Oh, I flew around once more at a respectful altitude, looking up into the faces of my comrades. A red flare flew up, ordering us to land. We landed. Jackie was right. Charles Widows was the man I had chosen as my target, and he looked deathly pale. This was one of the most dangerous low-altitude flights I've ever seen. As punishment, you will be on duty pilot duty for a week and consider yourself lucky. I said, Yes, sir. Looking over his shoulder at the faces of my comrades, I saw that they were trying desperately not to laugh. This punishment, among other things, made me responsible for laying out the portable kerosene lamps by which we landed at night, and for directing the night flights from a small van at the end of the runway. Within a week I had not flown. The punishment was fully deserved and I still got off lightly. It put an end to a game that had gotten out of hand and could have ended fatally. In November 1940 German night, attacks spread to cities other than London. On November 14, the Luftwaffe launched a powerful raid on Coventry and virtually destroyed the centre of this ancient city. It was a tense and exhausting time for us. During these heavy raids, each crew flew out twice and sometimes three times a night. Our buff fighters had just reached a condition suitable for combat sorties, and many of our flights were made in the old Blenheims. Even when we were fortunate enough to fly the Bug houses at night, there were problems with the radar or the radio operators were not trained enough to use it. During several gruelling nights, which included a raid on Coventry, the squadron failed to shoot down any of the attackers. We were angry and exasperated, unable to calm down when we saw the smoking ruins of the city during daytime training flights. On the night of November 19, while flying a Bui, I saw three enemy planes, but they were either crossing my course or coming toward me, so by the time I turned around, they were gone from my sight. The radar was out of order, and I cursed this device that would later bring me and other night fighters so many victories. At the time, all I could think was I missed another bastard. Towards the end of the year, I was sent on a course at Watchfield, near Swindon, to learn the latest instrument landing techniques in difficult weather conditions. I had flown in fairly bad weather and was confident in my abilities, but there was still a lot to learn. The first morning there, waking up in a wooden barracks, I saw that everything was hidden by a thick fog. I could only make out a neighbouring building. Great, I could go back to sleep, but nothing like that. There was a knock on the door, and my instructor told me to hurry up and head to the parking lot, as we should be flying soon. 
This is just the weather we need, he said. By the time the course was over, I felt I had learned a lot about radio landing in minimal to no visibility. I got a short Christmas vacation and visited my parents, who now lived in Duxford, a village near Cambridge that was home to one of the most famous day fighter airbases. My father was the parish priest of this small village. The vacation went well, but I rather quickly wanted to return to the squadron. I am afraid I upset my parents by doing so, but they must have got used to my fleeting visits during the war. There were changes in the squadron again. Veterans were transferred and there were new faces in the mess hall. They were all quickly getting into the spirit of the 29th which, despite small successes, had as high morale as any squadron in the Royal Air Force. The new year brought a lot of snow. During this cold spell, I received a call in the parking lot from Adjutant Sammy Friends asking me to stop by squadron headquarters as he had some news for me. I learned that I had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross, and that Flight Sergeant Mann, who had served with us since before the war, had been awarded the Distinguished Flying Medal. Of course, it was a surprise. Usually such an award was given to fighter pilots if they shot down at least three airplanes. I had shot down only one, and Mann by this time had shot down none. However, according to the award announcement, we were recognised for decisive action against the enemy in difficult meteorological conditions. Charles Widows congratulated us both, not only for our personal services, but as the first members of the squadron to be awarded during the war. Naturally, the occasion was an excellent excuse for a wild party, after which some of us, despite our duty to maintain combat readiness, had heavy heads for many days. A few weeks later, Manny and I were ordered to attend an award ceremony at Waddington Air Station. King George Vi, in the uniform of a Royal Air Force Marshal, arrived at the 5th Bombardment Air Group airbase to present awards to pilots from various units. For me, it was a majestic moment. We stood in the centre of a rack formed by the air station personnel in one of the large hangars. Before pinning on the award, the King shook my hand and said a few kind words. He always looked taller in photographs and on film. At that moment, I had no idea that I would meet him several more times in the future. By his bravery, determination and example, King George did probably more to keep the British spirits up than any other man in the Commonwealth of Nations, including the indomitable Prime Minister Churchill. Few monarchs have earned and received such unanimous respect and affection from their subjects. The people could have withstood the German blows more readily, knowing that their king and his family were fearlessly sharing all dangers and calamities with them. It is a pity that there is no way to present a bravery award to one's own monarch. King George I certainly deserved it. In February 1941, Sandy Campbell, my squadron commander, was reassigned. He was replaced by squadron leader Pat Maxwell. Meanwhile, a reorganisation of night fighter squadrons had taken place. The squadron commander was now a wing commander. One squadron commander had to have the rank of squadron leader, and the other squadron commander had to have the rank of flighty. This seemed ridiculous to us. We felt that the link commanders should have equal ranks and a few months later our view was officially confirmed. In the meantime, Widows was still our boss. Pat was the B-Link commander and Guy Gibson was in charge of the A-Link. As the senior flying officer in A-Link, I was Pat's deputy, an excellent lad both on and off duty. After training in the newly formed night fighter training and combat units, new crews began arriving. They already knew radar and how to use it. The squadron veterans, on the other hand, had familiarised themselves with the principles of radar use in short courses. It became more and more obvious that the pilot and radio operator must fly together all the time in order to work out the interaction. The most successful night fighter crews flew together for long periods and some, like Cunningham and Rawnsley, for the entire war. Our chances of interception were increased by the new GCI radars built on the east coast in our neighbourhood. We spent all our spare time doing training intercepts and giving our radio operators a chance to get to know their equipment in a big way. We often visited GC radar sites during the day and got to know the targeting operators personally so that our actions in night combat became the work of a cohesive team of a ground operator, an airborne radar operator and a pilot who knew each other by name. We now found the enemy with ease. No more aimless patrolling or attempting interceptions based on scant information. By mutual agreement, I married Sergeant Ross, a Canadian radio operator. He was a screwball on the ground, but in the air, a first-rate expert and rapidly acquired radar skills. I flew with Ross as often as possible 
and we developed an excellent rapport. The Germans soon began to give us more than ample opportunity to do so. In early 1941, the squadron was active and our number of victories began to rise. Widows, Guy Gibson and myself were successful in the first few months of the year. We all cheered when Charles Widows scored his first victory because he had always pursued it vigorously and had failed many times up to that point. One night he shot down a Yopka's 88 over the east coast which crashed near our base. The next day a group of comrades and I, including Widows, visited the crash site to find souvenirs for our mess hall. The enemy plane had gone down in a ploughed field and was being guarded by an air force guard. When we arrived, the bodies of the enemy pilots had already been removed, but the smouldering wreckage still smelled strongly of death. I didn't prowl around the wreckage like a detective, but one of the squadron members spotted something interesting in the mangled metal where the nose section had been. A short-barreled large caliber machine gun. It appeared to be in pretty good condition and we decided that this weapon would be a suitable trophy for the officer's mess hall. After a series of attempts, we managed to get the machine gun out, but before we did, we unearthed the gruesome remains, part of the leg of one of the German crew. Before this, I had not considered my case as killing a man. Air combat to me was an impersonal duel of one machine against another, without any of the unseemly pictures of ground close combat. But when I saw the crash site of that German airplane, I could not restrain a feeling of some remorse toward the enemy crew members who, like us, fought for their country. They will be mourned in their homeland as will any of our lost boys. My second confirmed victory was on the night of March 13, a beautiful, cold, moonlit night. Ross and I took off on alert and set a course for the coast near Skegness. As we gained altitude, Ross checked his radar. We leveled off at 4,600 meters and headed east at top speed. The GCI operator was giving us a visual on the enemy, giving us the current situation. He's six kilometers ahead. Within a minute you should be making radar contact. I asked Ross if he had detected anything. No, nothing, came the reply. Tension was rising. On a night like this, we should have been able to spot enemy aircraft from almost a kilometer away. To achieve surprise, we must plan our approach so that it would be difficult for him to see us when we got into firing range. The ground operator's voice was becoming increasingly tense. Uh, four and a half kilometers, slightly to the left and above. No contact. Ross then reported over the intercom. We have contact 3,700 meters and 20 degrees above. Smooth left turn. That was it. I pressed the transmitter copter and told the operator GCI. Mercy dumped. Good luck, Bob. Attack and make him. After the GCI operator left us, I was now calmly led into a position from which to visually detect the enemy by Ross. What position do you want to take, Bob? I want him about 30 meters above me. This position gave us an advantage. His gunners were looking at the sky, but it was very difficult to see the approaching dark object against the dark background of the ground. Ross and I wanted it above us, a dark object against a light background. In the same calm voice, I asked Ross to tell me exactly what turn I should make to shorten the range. Please steep right, smoother, now level off. Range 1800, and he is about 60 above. This information gave me a complete picture of the enemy's position relative to us. My eyes strained to find the airplane, but could not detect it. We were still too far away. I adjusted the brightness of my electric scope until I could see only its crosshairs. If it was too bright, it would damage my night vision, and it would take me longer to spot the enemy. The distance continued to shorten. Bob, hold that altitude. He's about 30 meters higher, at a range of 900 meters. I still couldn't see him. Okay. Take off a little gas. Range now 800 meters, hold that course. What's that? I thought I saw something. I blinked. My eyes were watering from the exertion. Yes, it was a black object, moving ahead of me and higher, but still far enough away for me to determine the type of airplane. I can see it, but keep pointing. It's still far enough away. Okay. Range 630 meters, a little to the left and above. I could now vaguely make out the twin tailplanes. I called the GCI operator. Natty ho. I think it's a Dornier. I'll confirm when I get closer. All right, he's all yours. I could now see the enemy clearly and identified him as a Dornier. Apparently, he still hadn't spotted me. I continued to close the distance. 
Ross lifted his head from under the visor of the radar screen and looked ahead through his flashlight in the tail section of the boy fighter. Do you see him, Ross? A second or two later it sound. Yes, I see him now. I had to get closer to be completely sure. The Dornier had just crossed the coast near Skekpus and could be heading for one of the Midland towns to drop its destructive cargo. I was now about 360 metres away. Ross was urging me to open fire, and it seemed that the moment to do so had arrived. If I continued to approach further, I would probably lose surprise and be spotted by the enemy tail gunner. I was ready at any moment to see tracers streaming in my direction, for it was a bright night. I gently pulled the wheel toward me, giving me a slight lid, and pressed the fire button. The four cannons roared and went silent a second later. Damn it, they're jammed, I shouted. I saw a flash on the Dornier fuselage where at least one of my four shells had hit, and the enemy began a gentle right turn back in the direction from which it had come. I followed him. Still, there was no return fire. I pressed the trigger of my weapon again. Nothing happened. Devil. Ross, can you get the guns in order? Ross had already left his seat, and after disconnecting the heavy sixty-round magazines from the guns, was moving the bolts back and forth to see what the malfunction was. Okay, try again, boss. I changed magazines. I placed the target in my scope again. The enemy crossed the coast again, obviously hoping to return home. There was still no return fire. I may have killed or wounded the tail gunner with my first short burst. I pressed the fire button. Again, nothing happened. The damned thing still wouldn't fire. Okay, I'll try the mechanism again. I think the oil in the guns is frozen. I decided I wasn't going to let that plane get away. Maybe we could ram it and make it out alive. We just had to get the math right, put our left plane under his right rudder of altitude, and then, with a quick lift, rip off his tail, and then he would lose control. We had just crossed our coastline, and we'd probably be found if we jumped out on parachutes. Okay, Ross, how's it going up there? Not so good. Okay, go back to your seat. I'm going to chase it down and ram it. You might have to parachute out. Wait another second. Try the guns again. They should be all right. By this time, the strain was wearing off. I was not happy about the thought of ramming, even though I thought it quite possible to avoid trouble in that case. However, there was the possibility that we would die, and Ross's suggestion gave me a few seconds to think. I took over the helm again a little and reduced the distance to about 45 meters, as it was obvious that there would be no follow-up fire from the tail gunner. The enemy did not seem to have sustained any heavy damage, and it was strange enough that he did not make any maneuvers to get out of harm's way. Perhaps since I didn't fire again after the first short burst, he thought I had lost him. I pressed the fire button, not hoping the guns would fire. You shuddered as they rumbled, and right in front of my face a Dornier 17 exploded with a blinding flash of flame. I was jubilant, but poor old Ross was utterly exhausted, as he had to disconnect the tube of his oxygen mask to get to the guns. Like me, he was happy that we didn't have to go for a ramming. As we turned around in the opposite direction, we saw the flaming wreckage fall into the sea. The GCI operators rejoiced at our success as much as we did. The news reached the airfield ahead of us, and as we climbed out of the airplane, it was surrounded by pilots and ground personnel. My mechanic had prepared a swastika stencil, and began applying two such emblems before we even went to the barracks in the parking lot. After we presented our combat report to the spy, I took the gunner to the gunner and asked about the problems with the guns. He answered me that malfunctions were often caused by oil freezing in the mechanisms in cold weather, confirming Ross's opinion. Notifications to this effect were carried out. Later, the Bu guns became more reliable, were heated and had belt-fed ammunition instead of drums. During this period of intense activity, Charles Widows and his radio operator, Flag Officer Wilson, escaped death only by good fortune. In doing so, Wilson owed his life to the courage of the pilot. After a report of the approaching enemy, Charles took off on alert and soon ran into trouble. The engines of his airplane failed, and the machine could not maintain altitude. It was not enough to turn around and land in a straight line at the airfield. When it became clear that nothing could be done, he ordered Wilson to parachute out. Willie confirmed the order over the intercom and left his seat to open the escape hatch in the lower fuselage. In doing so, he must have disconnected the intercom wire connector. Widows, suspecting that Wilson had disconnected the internal communications, gave him what he thought was sufficient time to leave the airplane 
and then left his cockpit to follow him. Fortunately, he looked back and in the darkness of the fuselage, he could vaguely make out Wilson still battling with the escape hatch. The plane was now only 300 meters high, and by jumping out, Widows could easily have secured his own rescue. But without hesitation, he climbed back into the cockpit and prepared for an emergency landing in the pitch-black Lincolnshire countryside. Luck was on his side as the flat and sparsely populated land stretched out below him. Wilson didn't know what was happening and must have assumed that by this point Widows had left the plane. One can imagine what he experienced as he desperately tried to open the tail hatch. Wilson knew that the ground was fast approaching, but Widows was steering his plane down toward the solid blackness below him as smoothly as he could. As his altimeter indicated that the airplane was about to touch the ground, he turned on the landing lights, took the wheel all the way down, and landed with the landing gear retracted in a field passing next to a mast carrying high-voltage cables. A second or so before the emergency landing, Wilson finally opened the escape hatch. He had no idea how high above the ground the budgie was, but decided to leave it, as there could be no hope of escape in a crashing unmanned airplane. Wilson had already stuck one foot out of the hatch when the plane touched the Cropeland and was seriously injured. Charles Widows was unhurt, and the squadron cheered his return. Wilson spent some time in hospital, and with a completely unbent ankle, and I am sure, with gratitude in his heart to the brave man who had saved his life, was reunited with us. The squadron experienced deep disappointment when Widow's cold-blooded courage went unnoticed. In our opinion, his actions could be rated as exceptionally brave. 